All right. Good evening, everybody. How is everyone doing? Woohoo! Woohoo! We're almost at the end, but alas, I'm here today, and my reality is broken because I'm with a legend in front of me. I'm here with Jane McGonagall. Oh, Jane. So, Tino, today we're here because we've been asked to talk about something really important, I think, in the game education community and games in general. And that's I think we need more volume on you. Yes. Hello. Yes, magic. Hello? Okay, great. So, I think we're here to discuss something really important, and what that is, is research, you know? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of theories going around, and it's important for us to back up these ideas with some real information so that what we know can be validated and understood and accepted by everyone. So Jane, you have a little game called Super Better, which I think everyone knows a lot about, but, ooh, 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 hello. <laughs> yeah, all right. But, you know, <laughs> for those who don't know, I think it's a great little thing. And Jen, could you tell the audience a little bit about Super Better for those who don't know? Sure. And I won't, I won't bore you um, because there's a great TED Talk you can watch about it if you, have, if you haven't heard about it. Um, but the short version is, oh my God, almost five years ago, um, next month, five years ago, uh, I suffered a mild traumatic brain injury that took a um, very couple years to heal. Um, and I wound up inventing a game to help myself with the anxiety and depression associated with healing from that kind of injury. Um, and, and it wound up sort of catching on for other uses, um, for everything, uh, losing weight, to trying to get pregnant, to trying to find a new job, to surviving a uh, breakup. And so we wound up making an app and making a, a web service. Um, and finally, uh, we have conducted some really good research um, to find out why it worked so well for me and for, uh, we have about 350,000 people who have used this now to tackle a really tough personal challenge. Right, right. And you know, we, I was able to look a little bit about that research before this interview, and what I found interesting is that you were stacking up this, this original game you made, um, the original Super Better game, against cognitive behavioral therapy ideas and positive psychology therapy. Yeah. And you also obviously could do that against a control, you know, yeah. double blind. So it's real. So I think what I'm interested in is why, like, the idea of using these, you know, cognitive tests uh, theoretically would perform really well. But I think you found something different in your design, in your research, right? Yeah, well, why don't I, I'll tell everyone a little bit about, um, we're doing two, two lines of research. The first is a randomized control trial that we've run uh, with the University of Pennsylvania. They actually ran it basically independently. Um, the researchers uh, found it very exciting and they wanted to test it. Um, so we gave them permission to do that. Um, and the results from that randomized control trial were just presented a couple of weeks ago here in San Francisco at the American, uh, the Association for Psychological Science. Um, and it actually won an award, the paper, uh, for the sort of top five breakthrough pieces of research, which for a game to receive that um, award was really exciting. And um, what they found was that Super Better um, eliminates six symptoms of depression in six weeks for a typical player. Um, and what, what you need to know to put that in perspective is that for most people, depression kind of comes and goes. And uh, if you don't do anything, you'll probably get rid of two symptoms of depression six weeks later. Um, so this game uh, was able to move people from just feeling you know, a little bit better to a lot better. Um, and uh, that, was, that was a really big breakthrough for us. Great. You know, I'm curious to know your thoughts on what in your research about when you're in a state of depression, it all feels like things are lost and you're down to dumps and nothing matters anymore. You know, and games are in this interesting place where they both simultaneously help us lose in a controlled environment without really you know, yeah. damaging ourselves, yeah. and they also help us succeed in an easier way than maybe life does. Can you speak to how losing in games or how winning in games help us you know, feel better about ourselves? Sure, well, one of the things that's really difficult about gamification is trying to get people to feel as optimistic about solving a real life problem as they do about solving an in-game problem. One of the things I hear all the time from folks who want to do gamification but they're a little bit skeptical is, you know, well, aren't there stakes in the real world? We don't, we don't, we can't just give people permission to do whatever they want and fail because it might have consequences. And especially in the health space where I'm working, right. 
there are real life consequences to not getting successful treatment for something like depression or anxiety uh, or a traumatic brain injury. Um, but if you look at the, the, the vast psychological research on how we respond to stress, it turns out that some people naturally respond to stress as if it were a game, or they, they have the same psychological reaction before gamification happened. I mean, they've been studying this for 30 years. Um, they call it a challenge mindset. And the challenge mindset just means that when you're confronted with a threat or a risk or the possibility of failure, you focus on the opportunity for personal growth or to learn something or to improve a new strategy or uh, some possible positive outcome that outweighs your concerns about the risks and the harms and the threats. And, and many people do this naturally um, because of uh, their emphasis on potential positive outcomes and growth. So what's really interesting is as game designers, we have an opportunity to take that 20% you know, of privileged people who naturally respond to stress with this challenge mindset and maybe increase it to 50% or 70% or 80% by cultivating it through the gamification technique. So that's one thing that we found very effective and super better. If you look at the 350,000 players, what's the first positive difference that they report feeling uh, from playing this game? It's a sense of control and agency over their situation. Even if they're playing for extremely serious um, types of adversity, things that are completely out of their control objectively, they start to feel um, well, they're in control of how much they grow or they gain or what they learn. And, um, and so I think there's a, there's a natural connection between decades of psychological research and what we can now do with the game design. Right. So clearly, you know, as we play more and more games, we're building up this, you know, mental strength within ourselves, right? And I know specifically in your research, you're looking at Super Better more as an um, interventional technique. Can you speak to if there's any positive ways of um, using it as a preventative medicine? Oh, well, that's really interesting. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, first thing I should say that I think is different that we've learned about Super Better than many uh, gamification um, practitioners have, have noticed yet mm -hmm. um, is that you don't have to play this game forever. Right. Um, and this is one of the biggest findings that I'm excited to you know, yell from the mountaintop, um, that you can play this for about 30 days, and it will change how you handle stress and tackle problems uh, for quite a long time. So in addition to the more controlled studies that we're doing, the, the, the trial at Penn, we also have an NIH-funded clinical trial um, going on uh, for the treatment of concussions. So on, besides those formal training, uh, formal studies, um, I've been following up a group of players, a sort of cohort of players that started playing two years ago. And we asked them to play for six weeks and document really thoroughly uh, what are your power-ups, who are your bad guys, what are your quests, what are your allies doing for you. Um, and, uh, and I've kept in touch with them for two years now. And it is amazing. These are not people who still have the app and they're, they're logging their power-ups and they're completing their quests. You know, they did it for a couple months and, and, and they, had their, they had their super better experience. Um, but they still use the techniques. They still think in this gamified language. They, they, they get up and they think, what are the power-ups I want to activate today? Or who are the allies I can connect with today? And as an intervention strategy, I think that is hugely important. Um, we don't have to make tools that people need to check into every day forever. We don't have to invent um, another kind of digital drain on your time. We can create experiences that transform you in a significant enough way um, that you play and you move on. And this is what happens in, with most games. Although some of us, we do get really, you know, maybe Minecraft or World of Warcraft, you get really tied into a game community for a long time, but most of us, we move on from games. And gamification, I think a lot of people think about trying to suck people's sort of time and attention forever. We will own you. Um, right. That's not necessary. Sure. And you know, I find that as a game designer, you're always making new games. So it's interesting that you know, as we're building these things, you know, we're getting stronger, right? But as a game designer, I think your career is built on making new games, yes. right? So how do you play, tap into both of those ideas of this concurrent you know, stamina of mental strength and 
uh, adding new design towards that? Like, how does that influence how you design games from this point forward? Oh, well, I mean, uh, I think I'm understanding. Am I understanding your question? I'm not sure. I'll just say things now, sure. and we'll hope Please. that they're... Uh, <laughs> they're um, well, sorry, so I'm working on my second book now, which is, which is basically the book version of Super Better. Because one of the insights that I've had from working on this project that um, made me very happy, although not everybody finds this exciting, uh, is that people didn't necessarily, necessarily need the technology in order to adopt a gameful mindset towards their real life challenge. And that people were able to benefit in measurable ways where you could measure an increase in their curiosity, in their optimism, in their perceived social support, um, their sense of determination and grit. Mm -hmm. You could improve those things by just playing a kind of pen and paper version of super better. Um, you, didn't need a, you didn't need a really sophisticated technological environment for it. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so I'm writing a book now because I realized, well, maybe we'll, maybe, maybe Super Better is like a folk game. I mean, you don't need an app to learn how to play hide and seek or baseball, right? Someone teaches you the rules and you go and play. So I'm starting to think of gamification as being possibly not necessarily a technological intervention, which I think would be cool. So I encourage all of you to think about um, other media besides, you know, apps and the uh, you know big web infrastructure that we could we could gamify people's experiences um, but to that point working on this book now um, and really digging into what is a challenge mindset and and how does mental resilience come from that sort of thing um, is really making it easier for me to write my book because i don't know so my first book when i was done i made my husband um, who's here today promise me that no matter what i said or no matter what happened never let me write a book again. It was, it was like, it was the worst. Uh, I'm, very, I'm glad I wrote the first book, but I like, I mean, it literally almost killed me. Like, I got the, I got the concussion while I was halfway through the book. Um, and I said, never again. But this time, uh, I, adopted a, I adopted all my super better strategies to write the book, and it's like awesome. I'm not going crazy. I have, a, I have a writing calendar that says, I love writing this book at the top of every page. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, on that note, I, I've always just was interested about how the offline and online, you know, game design affects you. And, you know, in your book, have you written about anything about sort of affecting your environment around you? Because I think that's what's really interesting, right? In games, they place us somewhere. But mm -hmm. when we're outside of it, we have little to no control of our outside environment, especially when it comes to things like depressive symptoms. Yeah. You know, how can we put ourselves in a more positive environment and take yeah, control yeah. of that? Well, you know, the first time I really noticed a game changing my environment or giving me the impetus to try to change my environment was when I played, when I played my own game, uh, World Without Oil, in 2007. Um, that was kind of fun. Um, it, it, this was a kind of a global collaborative simulation of an uh, oil shortage, and you documented through social media um, how you would survive uh, if, 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 if you couldn't get to work what would you do? Because there's, there's no gas, or, or you can't get food from more than three miles away. How do you feed your family? You try to live your life as if this were happening to discover new ways of, new sources of resilience and try out strategies. Um, so we played and it was awesome and I learned how important it was to know your neighbors. And I realized we didn't have any friends who lived within walking distance. Um, and what if we needed support or you know, social interaction? Um, so, uh, I make an effort now to try to cultivate friendships with people within walking distance uh, of where I live. And that's something that I continue to do seven years later, um, especially we moved to a new neighborhood this year. And that's, that's something that I, I think about all the time just because of this you know, game that I played for. I think that was a five week game. Great. You know, and in your original TED Talk, I was listening to it in preparation for this, and something I noticed was, you know, you're very heavy on looking at World of Warcraft as one of your examples, and how in participating in those online communities really help people, you know, build those skills and feel good about themselves. What I'm wondering is, you know, is there any difference with how we build our social experiences online than what we do offline? Sure. Because there's a reemergence of, you know, offline games yeah. too, right? Yeah. Especially board games, you know, yeah. even D&D. As nerdy as that might be, I think it's great, and people still do it, right? Yeah. So is there any difference in how those things you know, help us you know, evolve as humans? 
Yeah. Oh, there's, I mean, there's so much interesting stuff to know. So I'll just try to fire out some interesting research. So one bit of interesting research um, that many people intuitively believe the opposite of is that um, people that you play online games with will provide you with social support in real life. So if you do sort of longitudinal studies, um, this is some of the research that will be in my next book. Um, people who play even, you know, not the nicest, friendliest communities, the League of Legends, for example, they develop real sources of social support, people who will give them money in times of economic hardship, who will help them move if they need help moving, who will give them advice um, and, uh, you know, when they're having a hard problem. Um, and so that's, that's just something interesting to know about online communities, because they, they get kind of a, a bad rap. These aren't your real friends. And, uh, and, and so that's not true. We, we know that now. And we also know that if you play these games with people you know in real life, um, that every time you play, it increases the chance of you having a conversation about something unrelated to the game. So, you know, you do a little co-op game on Facebook, you're more likely to get into a conversation about, you know, what's going on with your cousins. Right? Um, so this is really interesting, the sort of uh, sociality that, that trickles outward. Um, I'm glad that Amy Jo Kim was here today doing an amazing presentation on co-op because the one thing that we know about um, the, the best possible thing you can do in games to increase your social resilience is co-op play or any kind of social grooming. Even something as simple and trivial as giving someone an extra life or three bonus moves in Candy Crush Saga increases the chances that you will talk to that person in real life outside of the context of a game, that you will have positive feelings towards them. You're more likely to help them with a the problem. Um, so building in little opportunities to kind of groom each other um, is, is really important. And that's really hard to do in real life because we don't walk around, I mean, you don't know what, I, what you could do for me today to make me better. I don't know what I could do for you in 30 seconds to make you happier. Um, and games give us a more structured way to do that. That's great. And would you say that still applies to even the ultra competitive games like Leave you mentioned, which is you know, one of the most popular games today, and yet you know, it still provides those feelings of rage I know, I know, and craziness. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, how does that still, you know, we still feel this hatred towards other people, and you have this world of trolls that exist out there? I know, I know. Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, the, this is the sort of public service announcement about um, basically all multiplayer gaming is good for your social resilience, meaning you become a more likable person, you have more sources of social support, except for playing competitively against strangers online as a primary form of play. Um, for lots of reasons, uh, your testosterone will get really jacked up um, and will stay jacked up for hours after you stop playing, which can make you less, uh, less agreeable around other people. You're kind of aggressive, kind of a jerk. Um, and so that can actually hurt your real life relationships. Um, also, you tend to feel hostility towards people who you don't know um, when you play against them online. If, if, if I know you, if we're friends, we're playing online, I don't develop that same sense of hostile feelings because we still have to be friends afterwards. Um, and if I beat you in a game, my testosterone actually goes down if I know you because that's sort of an evolutionary advantage uh, that we have. But we, I don't want you to hate me. We still have to be friends. So I lower my testosterone so you feel not too bad that I beat you in the game. Um, so uh, the, the short version of this is uh, don't spend all your time trying to be strangers on the internet. Beat your friends and family or co-op with strangers um, is better for you not to be such an aggressive jerk. But if you're being an aggressive jerk with teammates, your relationships with those teammates will improve, even if you hate the rest of humanity. So, you know, weigh the pros and cons, okay? <laughs> Harsh words for the killers out there. Be mindful. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit. You know, you brought to my attention this really interesting piece of research called, which you entitled, you know, Play, Don't Replay. Yeah, controversial. And very controversial, It is huh? controversial, yes. Yeah, so um, it involves a little bit of a little game called Tetris. Yes, happy 30th anniversary. By the way, do you guys all feel old or are some of you young because you're like, wow, 30 years old, that's older than me. Um, Tetris is forever. 30 years old, Tetris, this yeah. week, 30th yeah. anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so, um, well, this is, thank you for the chance to talk about this sort of informal project or initiative that I started um, earlier this year. Um, and it really speaks to the strange moment that we're in right now with science and, and gamification and games for positive impact. 
Um, there is a ton of research where, where scientists have done little experiments to see, oh, can playing a game help you uh, recover from depression or uh, lose more weight or strengthen your relationship with your parents? Um, and they'll do one randomized controlled trial or they do one clinical trial, uh, and then that's it. And they publish it and they get their they get their publication and it's really sexy and cool because it's games research and they're like just these normal, ordinary academic researchers who will do one thing on a game and they kind of go on to the next thing. And they've created this, this, basically this field of scientific literature that is just littered with these kind of one-off, two-off studies that could transform people's lives if they knew the research and if they knew practical ways to implement it. And uh, the controversy is, I think we should start getting that research out from behind the academic firewalls and telling people what's in it and letting them decide for themselves if it is a good intervention. So I got into a little bit of trouble uh, recently when I started very emphatically tweeting and blogging about a Tetris study, two trials done um, at Oxford University by tremendously gifted scientists who had an amazing theoretical background to support the hypothesis that playing Tetris within six hours of a traumatic event would minimize your chances of developing post-traumatic stress disorder. Specifically, playing Tetris within six hours after a traumatic event blocks your brain from forming visual memories that lead to flashbacks. And flashbacks is the hardest to treat symptom of PTSD, and it can lead to the most anxiety and distress. And they did two studies that showed this works, and they linked to you know, 50 other studies that explain the hypothetical, you know, the, the theoretical underpinnings. And uh, so you know, I think this is great. I think everybody should learn this technique, because if, God forbid, you know, something bad happens to you, you're in a car accident, and you start having flashbacks. I've, I've had this experience myself, um, where you know, you're in an accident, and you, you flash back constantly to it. If you can, within six hours, and you only have to play Tetris for 10 minutes to have the impact, um, you could help yourself. Um, but this is controversial because, well, it's only two studies. Don't tell people, don't promise people it might work, it might not work. It's true it might not work. Um, what if it prevents them from seeking proper therapy? Um, what, what if they think they don't need any assistance because they play Tetris so they're cured? I mean, there, there are some things to worry about, for sure. Uh, but I, I am now at the point uh, in, in my career where I feel like we have amassed enough one-off studies and somebody needs to take a hold of them and let people um, harness that power in their real lives um, because we know way more than you probably think we know. There are thousands of studies on the positive impact of games, particularly in mental, uh, abil cognitive abilities, and health, emotion, relationships, um, and it's just really stagnating. And so, uh, but we need to work out what the ethics are. Is it ethical to tell people, here's a couple studies, they say you should play Tetris for 10 minutes. Uh, how do we frame it in a way that you will get help if you need it, and that we won't do you any harm? Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take, I've decided I'm willing to take the controversy because um, I've heard from so many people who have been helped by just knowing about this research before something happened to them. Do you think there's problems with this ethical argument as a result of the intervention being games themselves? Well, Is there yes. a stigma oh, associated with it? Oh, I know. If, if, you, if you said something like meditate for 10 minutes or pray for 10 minutes or sit in a dark room for 10 minutes, nobody would tell you that you were probably causing great harm. Um, it is definitely the bias about games is part of, part of uh, what makes this seem so dangerous, because everybody thinks games are dangerous already. And so to suggest that games could be used in this positive way, um, it seems to require so much more um, evidence. And, and I'm all for evidence, and that's why we're doing our clinical trials, but at some point, we have to decide if the risks of playing a video game for 10 minutes, by the way, how many people play Tetris for 10 minutes every day anyway? I mean, it's, a whole, it's kind of, people are already dosing themselves. And wouldn't it be nice if they knew that, by the way, if you play Tetris after you um, were studying for an art history exam, you're probably in trouble because you probably just block the formation of all those memories. Um, by the way, here's another public service announcement. 
um, kids in high school and college who play really intense action games. Um, you know, Call of Duty is, is, a, is a fine example. Um, because that game is so, it kind of gets your adrenaline going, your brain perceives it almost like a potentially traumatic event, and it dedicates so many cognitive resources to reprocessing it after you're done playing that you learn, uh, that you remember less about what you were studying. So you have to play the game before you study um, and go to sleep. Because uh, if you play the game after you study and then go to sleep, uh, your brain will devote more cognitive resources to remembering what happened in the game than to what you were trying to study. Um, but people don't know this. People should know this. This is important. I'm a little shocked that playing Call of Duty might make you a little more stupid. I'm call, call me It'll crazy. make you smarter yeah. at spatial intelligence and decision making, yeah. but, but that's, your brain is dedicating its resources to getting better at things that Call of Duty requires you to be good at. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad for you, but you won't remember what you were studying. Mm -hmm. You'll be this amazing cognitive machine of multitasking and, and fast decision making and, and that yeah. sort of thing instead. Which maybe that's better yeah. than studying art history, I don't know. You know, I want to talk about that, uh, that spatial formation as, as a result back to the Tetris thing again, yeah. you know, because with Tetris, you know, obviously it's a spatial game. You have to, it's a puzzle and you have to match shapes together. But in all, for all intents and purposes, by comparison, it's a relatively, you know, low visually, low stimulating Visually stimulating game that's not, it's not very visually stimulating, right? It's not that intense on your eyes compared to some other things that just explode in your face, like even yeah. things like Tempest or, yeah. you know, the Centipede or stuff like that. Yeah. You know, so how but does that happen? The, well, the trick is, 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 it a, uh, is it requiring visual attention? That's what, and the easiest way to tell is um, uh, if you close your eyes or you're doing something later, do you still see it? So I'm, I'm still playing Candy Crush, so I still see when I'm done playing. I, I try to swap my two dogs with each other and things like that. It's really weird. They're black and white. I think, oh, just swap them. Um, and uh, that's because the, the demands on your visual processing, because the only thing you do in that game is, is process visual information. Um, so uh, you can have a lot of stimulating visuals, but if your objective in the game is, you know, something navigating and, you know, talking to characters and, like, whatever, that's not, that's not going to hijack the visual processing center. By the way, other related research um, that has come out in the last few months, multiple studies showing that playing these games like Tetris or Candy Crush um, helps people uh, squash cravings for alcohol, cigarettes, and food. Um, now, it's only about a 25% reduction in your craving, but in, in, the, in these studies, that was enough for many people to resist something they were trying to avoid. Um, so, you know, another practical bit of advice, if you want to not do something, um, you play one of these games for 10 minutes, and it stops your brain from imagining how amazing it's going to be when you have a cigarette or you eat the chocolate cake. Um, so... Yes, but, but playing other, you know, playing Halo is not going to do that. It's not sure. visually intense enough. Yeah, there's the beauty in that simplicity is that it helps you focus on that task and, you know, helps yeah. build that within you. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, you know and I, I want to wrap this up with just one more note. You know, you mentioned all these one-off studies and you wanted to be controversial, right? And we started with Super Better. So are you taking any controversial routes into adding more things to Super Better? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but... but um, one of the greatest joys of making Super Better has been realizing that it's not a game, it's a tool for teaching people to think like game designers. So yeah. m most of you, if you try Super Better, we, you can download power packs that give you quests and power ups, but the people who find the most success in long-term engagement with the game design their own power ups, they design their own bad guys and quests. And it's that game design thinking um, that uh, is so powerful and changes how you approach problems in your real life because you can then design your life as if it were a game. And so we have, you know, all of these players who are basically redesigning and reinventing Super Better for their own goals. And um, I would love to, um, I would love to open source, you know, the process of these these gamification systems uh, to allow it to the, you know. What, I don't know, what's the Minecraft of gamification? That's basically where I'm getting to it's here. Where, how can we have millions of people designing gamified experiences um, and spaces and interactions um, so that we can unleash the creativity of the players to really take these ideas forward?
Perfect. You know, and I hope, you know, the one thing I've been hearing for everyone is that, you know, we don't have that solution to gamification yet, and I hope we do find that Minecraft solution soon. So yeah. I think that's all the time we have. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.